Okay. Um, well, welcome, gentlemen. Um, and I'm glad you're here. I'm glad that our friends are there uh, on Zoom, too, our brothers. Um, first of all, I wanted to start off by letting you know, um, uh, I, I've i been trying to reach Don Marbury, and, and Don called and left me a message because, uh, you know, I just wanted to see how he's doing. And uh, some of you who know after um, that, that he, he took a fall, he got dizzy, um, I think after his vaccination actually, but he, and he fell and he hurt his back and his hip. And um, so he's, he's had a really hard time. Well, um, that's not any better. He can't get around at all pretty much now. And he ended up with some type of a carcinoma that they went in and did an operation in his brain and they went all the way into the skull and they could, they had to stop. They couldn't get it all. So let's just remember Don, Don Marbury, cause he's a great fastball pitcher and a good brother. And, um, so, uh, also wanted to just mention that, um, I met with Mike white, who's the FCA director for our area. Yesterday we had lunch and, um, He's um, he's flying to Israel tomorrow, so let's kind of keep him covered in prayer too. Um, he's um, he's been going quite a bit, and he's um, he actually knows a lot of people that is kind of dangerous to know. And so um, let's just remember our brother. He's he's really serving Christ, and they're doing a lot of good especially with some of the Muslims in that area, some of the Arabs in that area. He's had, he had, a, he had an Arab father who came up to him and hugged him and said, you know, I'm just letting you know, I don't really mind if you convert my son. There's some, some really powerful stuff that's going on over there with the FCA. Uh, so let's just keep them in prayer. Um, and... Um, the good news is pH is doing great. He went to his doctor. His doctor said, man, I got to take you off some of these meds. You're, you're getting too healthy. So, uh, anyway, you know, I'm just glad that he is. And, uh, um, I'm, and well, let's keep, let's, let's keep coaching in our prayers because coach is uh, starting his, uh, his radiation regimen and, uh, he's going to come through it. He's going to be, well, I'm speaking that he's going to be completely healed and be restored. And, um, so let it be so, Lord, in Jesus' name. So uh, let's pray real quick and invite the Lord here. Heavenly Father, how great it is to have you as our Father. There is no one like you, and you are good and wonderful and perfect and, and gracious. And so we are, we're excited to be um, your family and your ministers and uh, to be here in this place that's not our home but to serve as the hands and feet of your son, Jesus, while we're here. And then um, you're preparing a place for us. It's going to be unbelievable. We love you. We, we welcome your spirit to be at work in us and to be here with us today. And we ask that it would anoint um, Rick as he comes up to speak to us, that we, would, uh, that we would be touched by your beautiful and powerful hand. We ask it in Jesus' beautiful name. Amen. Gentlemen, good afternoon. It is good seeing you today. Uh, I don't know whether any of you have ever watched the Seinfeld television show, but one of the things they invented a holiday, Festivus, to combat commercialization of Christmas and things. And one of the features of Festivus was the airing of grievances. And I'm intending to start with the airing of grievances. Now, there's one among us that shall remain nameless, Steve Campbell, uh, that loves to rename the titles of my teaching efforts, usually in some kind of derogatory or provocative or weird fashion. I do notice that nobody else that leads this group has that kind of abuse foisted upon them. But I knew I had settled things this time because I came up with a better title than he could ever 
come up with, and he didn't even put it in the email. No. I told you, if you'd read my email, the title of our study today is Great Expectorations. Uh, thank you. Some of you get that. Uh, we're talking about healing that Jesus does. But, but think about it. Think, I hope you'll say that title really fits, and Steve should have lauded that title before. I thought about the biblical history of spit, but that's not quite as attractive as Great Expectorations. But think about this for a second, seriously. What we're going to talk about today is a topic that I guarantee everybody in this room has experience with. And I'd be surprised if you haven't done it several times already today. Yeah, I hope you brushed your teeth. Uh, you could often see it occur at sporting events, at a whole variety of sporting events, as a matter of fact. And we are indeed talking about spit. Now, I'm worried about this topic because we may be going down a slippery slope <laughs> as I talk about it, but I don't want to dampen your enthusiasm about studying the Bible. Uh, you know, baseball, this is baseball season, and baseball is full of spit. It's at the heart of one of the most unique rules changes in sports history. Now, you may know, some of you may be old enough to know this, pitchers back in the old days were allowed to doctor the baseball in any number of ways. And the spitball was considered a very effective weapon. Now, there was also a lot of tobacco chewing back in those days. And sometimes, and they didn't throw balls out very often like they do today. And often by, and all the games were played during the day, no night games, by the end, for the end of the game, the ball would have a brownish tint to it instead of the pristine white that you see today in the thrown out just a blemish. A spitball was indeed nasty. Now, the idea behind a spitball is when you lubricate and you throw, you can throw a regular fastball if you want to, but the lubrication causes it to come out differently. And then the aerodynamics of the ball are affected by the lubrication that is on it. And it can dart and do some uh, amazing things. Now, in the late 1919 time frame, the dead ball era, Babe Ruth was just starting to pitch with the Boston Red Sox. Uh, they wanted to increase the offensive output. So in February of 1920, the spitball was banned. In fact, anything that doctored the baseball was eliminated. Now, there was a spitball. There was the emery ball that you had an emery board or something in your glove, and you could scrape the ball, and that would change the aerodynamics as well. That thing would flutter all over the place. So the rule was changed in 1920. However, here was the wrinkle that is almost unprecedented. The 17 practitioners of the art of the spitball as their primary pitch were allowed to continue to do it, but only these 17 and only until they retired from the game, nobody else coming in could use it, and they were grandfathered in to throw the spitball. Now here, here's a good trivia note. Burley Grimes, the last pitcher to legally, legally throw a spitball, and he helped the Cardinals win the World Series in 1931. That's, you know, over a decade after the uh, rule was changed. But eventually then there were no spitball pitchers, or at least ones that admitted to that art. North Carolina native, Williamson Boy, Elliot's nodding, the Perry brothers, Jim didn't throw it apparently, but Gaylord did. Uh, now, he didn't use saliva. He used Vaseline or KY jelly, and he would move it around. His favorite place was in his pants, so he'd hitch his pants up and get a load to put on the ball. And, in fact, his autobiography, uh, written, I guess, in the, in the early 80s, was entitled Me and the Spitter. Well, well. Okay, I didn't, I didn't want to go there. <laughs> uh, but but and, and now if you've watched baseball, they instituted the check for foreign substances. Now it's something called Tiger Tack, which does something different. Because the balls are manufactured differently and they're slicker, the Tiger Tack, they're allowed, it gives them a better grip and a better spin rate to make the ball break. No, you could not have. 
But what about this topic from a biblical perspective? It's actually mentioned numerous times in the Bible, and it very often is not viewed in a positive light, and that cuts across many cultures and, and many locations. Now, uh, I viewed this time with trepidation. I cannot think of a single sermon or biblical teaching I've heard about this particular topic, and maybe as we go into it, I'll find out why there haven't been a ton of books or articles that explore this, this subject, the subject of spit. But I think we need to look at the biblical history of spit before we look at how Jesus used it himself. Now, Albert was fond of defining terms at the beginning, but I did not look in the dictionary to see the definition of our term today. You know what spit is, uh, and probably are in close proximity to some right now. Spitting at someone or on someone is the strongest sign of contempt, and that is recorded in the Bible and also in ancient Chinese literature. So when you think about spit in the Bible, maybe your mind goes, mine did at least, directly to the passion narratives, what was done to Jesus before he was crucified uh, throughout that whole process from his uh, arrest at Gethsemane and leading up to crucifixion. It's awful. It's painful. It's excruciating. The word there actually comes from, uh, from the cross, from crucifixion itself. But to make matters worse, it was the utter contempt with which he was uh, treated. He was spit upon several times. For example, in Matthew 26, starting in verse 65, in response to how Jesus answers the high priest on the charge that he is the Messiah. We read this. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. It happens again in the next chapter with the soldiers. They stripped him and put a scarlet robe on him and then twisted together a crown of thorns and set it on his head. They put a staff in his right hand. They knelt in front of him and mocked him. Hail, King of the Jews, they said. They spit on him and took the staff and struck him on the head again and again. They had mocked him. They took off the robe, put his own clothes on him, and led him away to be crucified. Uh, Jesus was treated with contempt, and this was the symbol. Uh, this was prophesied in Isaiah 50 in the Old Testament, uh, starting in verse 5. The Lord has opened my ears. I have not been rebellious. I have not turned away. I offered my back to those who beat me, my cheeks to those who pulled out my beard. I did not face hide my face from mocking and spitting. But as the late night television infomercials would say, but wait, there's more. There are some specific Old Testament references to spit, such as one in Deuteronomy 25 about Leverite marriage. Now, this is when the brother would die and the other brother would take the wife to continue the line, right? Deuteronomy 25. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. The first son she bears shall carry on the name of the dead brother so that his name will not be blotted out from Israel. However, if a man does not want to marry his brother's wife, she shall go to the elders at the town gate and say, my brother's husband's brother refuses to carry on his brother's name in Israel. He will not fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to me. Then the elders of his town shall summon him and talk to him. If he persists in saying, I do not want to marry her, his brother's widow shall go up to him in the presence of, his el of the elders, take off one of his sandals, spit in his face, and say, this is what is done to the man who will not build up his brother's family line. That man's line should be known in Israel as the family of the unsandaled. Back in those days, the exchange of a sandal was a sign of a covenant. And so they were taking the, the, the covenant seriously here. Leviticus weighs in on this. If the man with the discharge spits on anyone who is clean, they must wash their clothes and bathe with water, and they will be unclean till evening. So spit from one considered unclean would defile another, and they couldn't enter the temple until that cleansing had taken place. Did you know that there are almost 20 references in Scripture to spit? Many of those, such as the episodes with Jesus 
and others found in Job were to display utter contempt and disgust. And so you may be asking, what in the world, where is he going with this? Well, we're going to go to Jesus. I think that's a good place to go. The Savior, as you well know, healed so many people during his three-year ministry on earth. He did those in a whole host of different kinds of ways. He laid hands on them. He actually touched them. He had some cases of doing it long distance just by his words. Once the woman with the issue of blood, what did she do? She touched his garment, and she was healed in that way. So there was not a single given basic guideline or formula that he always used to accomplish the healing for those that he actually healed. But there are three times, three, that he actually uses saliva, that he uses spit to do the healing. We know, given this track record of healing and how he did it, that it wasn't required for him to do that, right? There must be some kind of didactic importance, some kind of teaching thing he's trying to do there, maybe even for us. So we're going to look at those three stories in Scripture. Now, for additional context, there was some general notion during this time that spit might have some sort of medicinal purpose. This idea was common to both Jews and Greeks. Even though it was a sign of contempt and Jews found it nasty, that it could be used in certain settings uh, for healing. Uh, Pliny the Elder, a Roman writer and a contemporary of Jesus, has a whole chapter in his book on natural history about the many potential healing uses of saliva. Now, maybe you aren't aware of this, but for this to have any hope of working, it had to be what's called fasting saliva, meaning saliva in the morning before one eats breakfast. And he specifically said, and I quote, Pliny the Elder said, eyes may be cured by early morning fasting spittle. Did you know that you do not swallow your spit while you sleep? That's why it's fasting spittle. I didn't expect to learn, learn that much about this subject as we started. Uh, keep in mind, though, that Pliny, who was a contemporary of Jesus, would have written after Jesus performed these miracles in question, and so maybe that's where he saw the most effective use of spittle. And we know now from modern science that human saliva contains histatins, which have antibacterial and antifungal properties, as well as neutrophils. Dr. Taft can correct me if this is not right. They have an abundance of white cells that can protect us from infection. So we know some of the properties of spit, some of the biblical history of spit, and let's look at what Jesus did with that subject. Uh, two stories in Mark and one in John. What's going on here? And they're, they're all a little bit different. So look at the nuance. This is first from Mark 7. Then Jesus left the vicinity of Tyre and went through Sidon down to the Sea of Galilee and into the region of the Decapolis. It starts in verse 31 of Mark 7. There, are, there were some people, there are some people brought to him, a man who was deaf and could hardly talk, and they begged Jesus to place his hand on him. After he took him aside, away from the crowd, Jesus put his fingers into the man's ears. Then he spit and touched the man's tongue. He looked up to heaven and with a deep sigh said to him, Ephatha, which means be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, he began to speak plainly. Jesus commanded them not to tell anyone, but the more he did so, the more they kept talking about it. People were overwhelmed with amazement. He has done everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf to hear and the mute speak. And we talked a little bit earlier about the fact that there was no basic predetermined formula about how Jesus uh, healed people, that, that he followed to do that. And this story is a little different in a couple of ways. Number one, he pulls the man away from the crowd, a detail that gets our attention. Maybe it was to avoid the excitement with people watching, perhaps because the man was deaf and had trouble communicating, he pulled him aside to get his complete attention in a different kind of way. The man couldn't hear anything, so he could not understand necessarily what Jesus would say or respond to the verbal cues in terms of how to, how to proceed. I think one thing we can see from just that snippet of that story is the approach that Jesus takes here and in other stories too is personalized. It is specific 
to what that person needed in that situation. Now, I think people were always looking to see what that formula actually was. The words that he used or the gestures that he made, focusing on the mechanics, maybe if they could replicate that somehow to use the incantation like magic, that they'd be able to do it too. But there was no formula to pin down. It wasn't about what was said or whether spit was used or touch or whatever, or even the props like mud that we'll talk about in just a moment. It was not about the healing, but about the healer himself who demonstrated his authority over everything, but over all sorts of diseases and maladies and even death, the transforming power of God through Jesus. And that's, that's the key point to remember. But since there was a general idea in the culture that saliva could be healing, when Jesus spat, maybe that signaled to people, including the person being healed himself, that maybe this is a sign that healing is coming. Maybe they had a high view of the potential of saliva's healing properties. So given that, maybe Jesus used spit to communicate his intention to heal, to kind of say, here is what is coming next. Now, since one has to hear in order to speak, the order Jesus does this is interesting. He puts his fingers in the man's ears, so the deaf and mute man would realize he's working on his hearing first. Then Jesus spit and touched the man's tongue. Now, I wonder what he thought about when that occurred in this one-on-one -on -one aside from the crowd. Notice what's said in the story, too. Jesus says, be opened. At this, the man's ears were opened, his tongue was loosened, and he began to speak plainly. The deaf and mute man could now hear and speak. And note the editorial comment. This is interesting. Speak plainly. So he was transformed in a moment, unlike how he was able to do it before. So the man called the logos in Greek, in the prologue to the Gospel of John, in the beginning was the word, and the word was God, and the word was with God. The word brought words into that man's life. And the man could now also hear the word. I think it's also instructed that Jesus said, be opened. That's larger than just with the tongues or the ears, the things that he was working on. When we are healed, are we open to the fact of what has occurred? Are we open to the healer and all that he represents besides just the physical manifestations of healing? And even with this, this unusual approach to healing that Jesus took, the crowd reacted strongly. It said people were overwhelmed with amazement. He does everything well, they said. He even makes the deaf hear and the mute speak. But the healer was well aware of the healing properties of saliva, but especially his when he was applying it. Now, in the very next chapter of Mark, we have another similar, similar story. They came to Bethsaida, and some people brought a blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. Like the first story, they went, just touch him. He said, place his hand on him in Mark 7, here in 8, touch him. He took the blind man by the hand and led him outside the village. When, you had spit, when, when he had spit on the man's eyes and put his hands on him, Jesus asked, do you see anything? He looked up and said, I see people. They look like trees walking around. Once more, Jesus put his hands on the man's eyes. Then his eyes were opened. His sight was restored. He saw everything clearly. Jesus sent him home saying, don't even go into the village. Now, again, the first thing we notice in that healing story, people brought the blind man and begged Jesus to touch him. They didn't say heal him. They said touch him, as though that would be all it would take. Uh, the word in Greek is hapto, which means to touch, not to heal. But maybe that's they knew that in Jesus' hands, that's all it would take to clear up that malady. And we also notice, like the chapter earlier, that Jesus doesn't heal him right then and there. Again, leads him outside the village by taking him by the hand. He applies the spit to the man's eyes and then asks that question, do you see anything? And the man says, he looks up and says, I see people. They look like trees walking around. This is the only example of a two-step healing or a gradual healing among the miracles Jesus did. The man was be better than he had been. He could see a little something. He could see the people that looked like they were trees, uh, but that is not distinct. So Jesus touches the man's eyes again. His eyes were opened, his sight restored. And could it be that means not just that he could see people 
or people and not trees, but maybe he's open to more. It's deeper that believing really is seeing, and the man could now clearly see the healer and the authority that he had, and that's why he was healed. Now, we don't really know why uh, it was gradual. It certainly isn't because Jesus had to try it a little bit harder to make it work this time. He didn't give him a full jolt. I believe that Jesus knew that for this individual, maybe his sight rushing back might be too much of a shock to the system. So he did it more gradually. And then Jesus gave that explicit direction that he didn't always do in those cases. Sent him home saying, don't go into the village. And maybe that seeing only partially related to how many people, especially religious leaders, saw Jesus. They didn't see him clearly. They didn't understand that he was the son of God. And, and maybe it operates on that level too. So two different stories using saliva with a little bit different uh, methodology, pulling the man away. Uh, then there's a great story. It, it's a very long in-depth story in John 9. And a lot of the story in the ninth chapter of John has to do with the follow-up in the aftermath of the healing. Notice how this, this one starts in the beginning of chapter 9 of John. As he went along, he saw a man blind from birth. His disciples asked him, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents, that he was born blind? Neither this man nor his parents sinned, said Jesus. This happened so that the works of God might be displayed in him. As long as it is day, we must do the works of him who sent me. Night is coming when no one can work. While I am in the world, I am the light of the world. And in interesting that light and darkness that John uses a lot in a story about a blind man. After saying this, he spit on the ground, made some mud with the saliva, and put it on the man's eyes. Go, he told him, wash in the pool of Siloam. This word means scent. So the man went and washed and came home seeing. His neighbors and those who had formerly seen him begging asked, isn't this the same man who used to sit and beg? Some claimed that he was. Others said, no, nah, he only looks like him. But he himself insisted, I am the man. Now, this story has some other uh, differences from the spit stories you've talked about. It begins differently with a different premise. The first thing we see about this candidate for healing is discussion about why he is blind, not that he needs to be healed. That was the question the disciples asked. Who sinned, this man or his parents? And that was, that was a question of the day. It was a theological issue being discussed. Why is he blind? Whose fault is this? If he were born blind and it's his fault, does that mean he sinned in utero? Was it something his parents had done? Is he responsible? But notice how Jesus answers the question. He doesn't get involved in any kind of protracted debate. He doesn't really even entertain the debate. He says, neither this man or his parents sinned to cause this. This happens so that the works of God might be displayed in him. And Jesus goes on here to say that we must do the works of him who sent me. And isn't it interesting that he sends him to a place that means sent. And he points out that while I'm in the world, I am the light of the world. So don't you think that John might be doing some foreshadowing here? As Jesus says this, it points to the fact that the man is going to see the light and bask in the light, and that's with a capital L, in just a little bit. There are other wrinkles in this story, too. Nowhere else does Jesus spit on the ground and make mud and apply it to the man's eyes. And then he gives the man specific instructions. He didn't give the other guys instructions after the healing, did he? He said, just don't, don't go tell anybody about it. He says, go wash in the pool of Siloam. This is a different methodology than Jesus has used uh, before. But I think part of it is he's messing with the Pharisees, even though the narrative hasn't revealed all the facts about this situation yet. Because just a few verses later, we learn that this takes place on the Sabbath. Verse 13 says this, now the day on which Jesus had made the mud and opened the man's eyes was the Sabbath. So not only had Jesus healed on the Sabbath, which had created problems other times, but he made mud on the Sabbath, which meant that he had engaged in work, making mud was, was, it was defined as work. So he had done work that day 
another disqualifying factor in their eyes. Notice they don't dwell on the fact he healed the man. No, you did it on the wrong day and you worked in the process of doing it. They're not impressed at all, apparently, or concerned that a man blind from birth was healed. Later on, they question because they don't really believe he was blind from birth. That's part of the aftermath. They are upset that Jesus was working, uh, making mud, and healing. Now, as we noted, this story is different because usually when there was a healing done by the Savior, there wasn't any reciprocity or response required by the healed one. Jesus did it. We examined the person's reaction, and that's it. Here, though, the man was told to go wash in the pool of Siloam, which means sent. So Jesus sent the man to wash in the pool named Sent. Now, keep in mind, this is not a story about the restoration of sight. This is about the creation of sight. He was born blind. Jesus connected the gift of sight to the blind man's obedience to his command to wash in the pool. The father had sent Jesus, and so now Jesus sent the man to the pool for the completion of the miracle. The man didn't yet know who Jesus was, but he responded to that powerful kindness. He, he, he was obedient. Maybe this points out that in some cases, uh, the, the fact is our own obedience is necessary, our own response to who Jesus is, to fully live in what Jesus has in store for us. That even in view of the fact that his healing is a sign of his love and his grace, uh, and we know that he heals all kinds of people in Scripture without asking them to do something or even evaluating their faith or their qualifications. But if you were to do that, would we be willing to be obedient and to, and to respond as that man did? And there was lots more response after that as they questioned his parents and all kinds of things about was he really the one that was healed? Now, I also think that it's appropriate when we're together to think about Albert Long and Max Lucado. So I thought it might be appropriate to quote Max Lucado in our Bible study. Uh, I do have every book that he has written. He has a new one that came out this week, by the way, called They Walked with God, about 40 different biblical characters. But this is what Max Lucado says about this specific story in John. And in a way, it relates to all three of the examples that we're studying. And this is a Lucado quote. <clears throat> now, there is something you don't expect to read in the Bible, Jesus spitting. A prayer would have seemed appropriate, perhaps an alleluia, but who expected a heavenly spit into the dirt? The God who sent manna and fire dispatched a blob of saliva. And as calmly as a painter spackles a hole in the wall, Jesus streaked miracle mud on the man's eyes. Lucado says sometimes God uses the less than pleasant. He initiates the miracle through mud moments, layoffs, letdowns, and bouts of loneliness. Can you relate? If so, do not assume that Jesus is absent or oblivious to your struggle. In fact, just the opposite. He is using it to reveal himself to you. He wants you to see him. Remember, friend, you are never alone. End quote. So perhaps this is one thing we can learn from these three stories. God sometimes uses the less than pleasant. In, in this case, he's using spit that throughout history and enumerated in many places in Scripture is a sign of contempt and hatred. In fact, Gehenna, which is a, a word used for hell, where the garbage burned, the colloquialism for that, it, we translated the place of spit, where nothing valuable could ever be found. Gehenna, hell. But the idea that in God's economy, he can use something less than pleasant or something that's considered awful or even defiling and transform it into something that is beneficial. That is God's economy. He does it all the time. As Joseph said to his brothers, you meant it for evil, but God used it for good. We have made spit a sign of contempt and hatred, and here Jesus uses it for good. Our expectations for how Jesus should work or should heal or should operate need to be set aside because he does not follow the same script nor use the same method every time. It is always personal. But carry this a step further. If Jesus can do this with spit, a commodity that none of us really value at all, how much more important, how much more valuable is his blood? 
I hope, I hope we know, and I think we do, and understand what his blood has done for us. And in fact, it has healed us far beyond any way we could ever imagine, and certainly in a way that we all need. So maybe this helps us understand both the cost and how Jesus has healed us in a really far, far greater way. Things that don't appear to have value for us can have value when they're used by Jesus. Things that do have value for us can have infinitely more value in Christ's hands or in Christ's feet or in his side. Our own needs move Jesus just as powerfully and personally as he was moved by these blind people. He will help you trust him, even though you may not understand the reason for your circumstances. He may even change your circumstances. Certainly, he will change you as you come to him and continue to live into his light. And he may use something worthless or perhaps something precious to help facilitate that change, which is why perhaps we should be on the lookout for great expectorations. Let's pray. Father, we sometimes focus on the, on the formula, on the healing instead of the healer, and open our hearts and minds to how this story may apply to us and what it has to say to us that you can even take something as worthless as saliva and your son uses it to heal. We thank you for loving us enough that you sent your son. We thank you for your desire to heal and to let us live in the light of the light of the world. Thank you for this time in Jesus' name and through the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Well, I'm wondering what you think about Jesus using saliva to heal. Three different stories, three different ways that he did it. Uh, again, I don't want to dampen your enthusiasm to speak, but I think that... Uh, Great, 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 great. I was wondering who's going to break the ice on this one. Clearly one of the most difficult wounds we ever take care of are human bites. Oh. And one of the common causes of, or common things we see with human bites are people that have lacerations over their knuckles from somebody else's tooth. And that creates a huge problem. However, what's the first thing that any of you do when you cut your finger? And they don't get infected. <laughs> Amen. Thank you for that, Tim. How's a doctor's perspective? Yeah. Uh, Steve, I just want to say that that was so interesting that I didn't even have a tendency to fall asleep and drool. <laughs> yeah. So. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, I guess drool would be a lot of spit, wouldn't it? So. Well, I mean. I, I missed. Oh, my <laughs> So I, my takeaway on that is that if I'm going to spit on somebody I love, I should fast first. Is that what you're saying? Do it in the morning. Yeah, do it in the morning while I'm in fast. <laughs> that, 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 that'll have the healing perspective. Well, I do have a question for Eddie Smith up there because Eddie Smith is out in eastern North Carolina. Now, Eddie, don't they have some kind of spitting contest out in eastern North Carolina? I think so. Uh, they got hog collar, hollering. They've got spitting. I couldn't help but think when Rick was talking about my friend Gaylord Perry, uh, I have Gaylord's uh, Hall of Fame jersey hanging in my office. And he used to drop by a lot and ask my receptionist if I could come out and play, which meant could I go to lunch. But uh, he told me later that a lot of times he didn't have to doctor the ball because they thought he was doctoring it, and that was enough. But uh, very, very interesting meshes today, Rick. Thank you, Eddie. Thank you. Well, did Gaylord ever spit on you, Eddie, by any chance? No, he didn't, but he showed up one day and asked the receptionist if I could come out and play. And she called my office, and I had some guests there from Florida. And I said, well, just tell them to have a seat. I'll, I'll, I'll get with him in a little bit. She said, no, you need to come right now. So I excused myself. I went out there, and he, had, he was standing there. And if you knew Gaylord, he was a huge man. He had two African lions, one under each arm, about yay big, snarling like crazy. And he said, I hear you've got a new whatever foot boat. He had several of our boats. He, he said, I want to go out in the plant and see it. I said, let me tell you something, big man. Every time you walk through my plant, it cost me 10 grand and lost production. If you think you're going to my plant with two lions under your arm, you're crazy. 
<laughs> it's a whole long story behind that, but but that's a true story. Oh, that is great. That's great. Of course, when Eddie shook Gilbert's hand, his hand slipped because of the Vaseline that was on <laughs> his hand. Thanks, Eddie. Anybody who's ever had a pet, especially a cat, the cat's been in a terrible scrape, he'll sit in the sunshine and lick his wounds. And we have that phrase. That phrase, yeah. Home licking my womb. Yeah. But I, I wonder when uh, Christ spit in the clay and touched the man's eyes, if there's not a, a little piece of Genesis where God formed man of the clay of the earth and he, he formed that clay. And it doesn't say in Genesis he used spittle, but it makes you wonder. Um, he's clearly pointing towards a new creation. And again, that was created site, not restoration. So that's a, that's a really interesting point. Yeah. Eric, do you, uh, you got your hand up. You want to, you want to speak? Yep. Um, <laughs> this service today was really something. But I can tell you what, if I was there now, there's a man in that audience that him and I could tell historic stories on spit. <laughs> Wrestlers are known for spitting. They cut pound after pound and i'll tell you what the girls that used to help with wrestling they used to complain when they had to ride on that bus because boy oh boy they would never stop spitting and it was incredible i've seen people spit five pounds it was just incredible they do anything to cut weight and they want to get on that mat but they've sometimes got to make weight so spitting away was the way to do it Water was the quickest thing to get rid of. What he just said about cutting weight, was that's uh, honest to God truth. But what I think about is like this. When you're really dehydrated, you can't spit. That's true. And I've seen people who cut weight so much that their tongue were split and they were bleeding, but they, they had no saliva to to help. So, you know, I just uh, wanted you to understand that if nothing else, it shows that you're not dehydrated. Where else can you get information like this, right? Well, not only do athletes spit, preachers spit. <laughs> I, when I first got involved in ministry, I, I hadn't gone to seminary yet. I had no credentials. So they sent me off to this two week licensed to preach school at Pfeiffer College in the middle of the summer. And people who didn't go for ordination and went for license to preach, usually country preachers and mountain preachers, they just, they just weren't going to spend four years in, in cemetery. <laughs> <clears throat> so we're two weeks at Meisenheimer, North Carolina, Pfeiffer College. And I'm looking around at the 14 of us, and I'm the only city boy there. And uh, one guy after the first break went out and put a chew in his mouth <clears throat> and came back into the classroom. And we got seminary professors and he proceeds to bring a cup into the class and spit. And it was very discernible noise that you heard. Well, when he got away with that, after the second break, there were four guys in there with <laughs> coffee cups. <clears throat> and by the end of the first day, I am the only one not spitting. <laughs> And this goes on for two weeks. So you can almost punctuate the sounds of the preacher or the teacher with all over the room and made me think, well, if I'm going to get a license to preach, I got to learn to chew and spit. <laughs> Yeah, for those who didn't hear Dr. Taft, he said they do have spittoons in the Supreme Court. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I was thinking of on a grander scale than spit in general, but uh, about the fact that what? why did Jesus do this? 
And then he said, what do you, what do you think? Uh, didn't have to, right? You could have spoken the word, done whatever. Well, God says, my ways are not your ways. <laughs> I think um, to understand this passage fully, you have to understand the Levitical law. Uh, terribly boring reading in the book of Leviticus until you realize that thousands of years before medical science, we were taught sanitation uh, we were taught uh, isolating or quarantining the sick uh, quick disposal burial of the dead to drink from running water um, the levitical law has fallen far from favor today but I, i've been rereading it some lately especially since it's um gay month um where they've hijacked a sign of, of God's grace, the rainbow, and they're proud about their sexual outness. Um, Leviticus talks a lot about uh, managing human waste, uh, urine and uh, blood is not a waste, but it um, factors in there. And the same with uh, excrement, you know, buried outside the camp. When you have a, a sexual relationship that um, you take the, the male phallic symbol and put it in the anus, the place of death, why would you put the symbol of life in the place of death? And then you put it in your mouth and bingo, you get sick. If you go to a doctor today, they, they check your um, number one and number two, and they check your blood. They're they carry pathogens and on. The Levitical law is very concerned with things like that. And um, I think Christ had his roots as a good Jewish rabbi in the Levitical law, which says a lot of things that I, I admit I don't fully understand. But I get the big picture that God is saying to the Egyptian, uh, to the Israelis, if you obey my law, I will put none of these diseases among you that the Egyptians had. And I think this is just the tip of the iceberg. People um, like to lop off the Old Testament or call it legalistic. And I say, come on, really? Are, are you wanting to get rid of the quarantine? You wanting to get rid of sanitary laws? I'm looking into medical and I think when God created human being, he brought his mouth into the human being and the human being become alive, okay? And the speaking may be also when you say it's um, the pandemic, okay? When you speak, the saliva will have the virus, okay? And so I think thing is uh, that uh, when God brought the air into the human being, it's almost like the spirit, okay? That is, he gives the life to the human being by boring. I think the spirit maybe also is the kind of cure from his mouth, from Jesus' mouth into, you know, the people is sick. Okay, and that's one of the, the biblical kind of uh, experience I'm looking into. Another main thing is, you know, is in the after Second World War, the British have a law in Hong Kong. When you speak, they catch you. Punishment is a hundred dollars. Okay, because they said so many Chinese come from mainland to Hong Kong, everybody split. So what they do is they pass the law, okay, in the immigration department. Anybody coming to Hong Kong, if you split anybody from resident of Hong Kong, if you split, you can't cut hundred dollars because you may spread virus. 
in the colony. <laughs> okay, and that is a medical. So the spreading actually is some form of life. Okay, either it's evil or it's good. When God brought the breath into you, the human being, that's a life. Okay, but in Hong Kong, that's evil. Thanks, Peter. Anybody else? I don't believe I've ever had a spitting conversation before. So thank you for bringing that to us. Well, the. Oh. Uh, Eric, you got another thought? Yes, I do. I, I spent took oh, three or four trips to Istanbul, Turkey. But one of the trips I took over to Istanbul, I had a young Greek wrestler that I took with us on the team. And boy, oh boy, he was chewing tobacco. You know, we went through an epidemic of chewing tobacco there for quite a while, um, all over the place. And um, this Greek boy, he just, I, I ended up to this day calling him Pacachu. And it was a filthy habit, but I don't know where they picked these things up, but we had a, a famous wrestler that came here from, um, oh, it was a rack. It was Kazoo. And he brought that habit over to here to, uh, he lived in Michigan for a while and he was something, but we got a lot of the infiltration from other countries because we brought in a lot of wrestlers. Dean Rockwell did from other countries and, um, you found out a lot of things that were going on over in Europe and uh, in those countries, and that was one of them. Live and learn till the jaw falls out. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. Well, maybe the whole idea of a spitting image means something different to you now than than it did than it did before. Uh, well, let's close in prayer. Father, we are grateful for your word, and we are grateful that you can even use the not so pleasant or even things that we think might be contemptible. You can use those for our greater good as well. And we thank you for the various ways that you heal us. And, and my prayer would be that we would, our eyes would be open, that we would see the light and bask in the light and be drawn to the light and want to attract others to your light as well. I'm grateful for each man here and the gifts and graces you have given us. And we pray that we will go forth from this place and use those gifts to point people to Jesus. We ask it all in his name and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you.